through that whole chapter this morning, <laughs> beginning in verse 1. Uh, I will read through the first section, but I want to uh, try to focus your attention on verse number 2 and talk to you this morning about the blessing of seeking God, the blessing of seeking God. Psalms 119, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in His ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep Thy precepts diligently Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you in song. Lord, thank you for reminding us, even in the uh, song service, that our songs should be directed towards you. Lord, it's not the, our voice that we should be concerned about. It's the direction of that voice as it is lifted up to your name. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified. Lord, you know us uh, far better than we could ever know ourselves. And Lord, every individual that's in the service this morning, they have unique temptations. They're facing different and diverse trials. And Lord, some are going through some great struggles. But Lord, I pray that your word would be a, a, the soothing balm of Gilead, that it would help the hurting. Lord, that it would lift up those that have uh, fallen or discouraged Lord, that you would mend the broken heart, that you would give sight to the blind. Lord, that you would give the deaf hearing. We pray, God, that you would help those that are here that are unsaved. And Lord, they're just one heartbeat away from spending eternity in hell. And God, I pray somehow that you would open up their understanding to the gospel, that they would be saved before it's eternally too late. And Father, I pray that you'd press upon them this morning and that the Holy Spirit of God would help and succor them, draw them to Christ, so they would be saved. 
But Lord, I pray that You'd meet each need and that You would be glorified this morning. Help us to say exactly what Jesus would say if He were to stand before the people today. Lord, help us that we might honor You, meet every need. And Lord, we ask You to do that for Christ's sake and for His glory. Amen. Amen. Psalms 119, I want to draw your attention to verse number 2 because there are many passages in the Bible that talk about the blessed people, those that have been blessed, uh, those that have the blessing of God on their life. In fact, if you'll go through the Psalms, you'll see just a little bit of that in the Psalms. Psalms number 1, the very first Psalm, Blessed is the man. We'll not quote that whole Psalm uh, for you this morning, but you remember he doesn't walk after the counsel of the world. Blessed is the man that doesn't listen to the world, but his delight, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and he doesn't just say, Pastor Rick, I love the Bible. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. That man is a blessed man. Psalms 2, of course, blessed, verse number 12, blessed are they that put their trust in Him, that is their trust in the Son of God. Psalms 32, 1, blessed is, the, the, blessed is He whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Amen? I don't know of anything that should cause you to rejoice uh, greatly than knowing without a doubt that your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west and God is not going to hold you accountable for your uh, unlawful life because that's been placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, when the disciples came back rejoicing that they had power to heal people that were sick and even cast out demonic spirits, Jesus said, don't rejoice in that Rejoice rather that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? Your sins are forgiven. Heaven is your home. You should be the most excited people on planet earth because you're going to stand before God and your sins have been covered, they have been removed, they have been taken away. Blessed, Psalms 84 verse 4, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house they will be still praising thee. Amen? That would be a great church service, right? When you go to church, and it's a blessing to be in God's house, and then when you leave the house of God, you're still lifting up a hand to heaven saying, Lord, it's just amazing how wonderful you are to me. Psalms 94, 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest. Woo! O Lord, teachest him out of thy law. Blessed is the man that God loves enough and cares about enough that he'll chasten him and help him to stay on the right track. And I know when we're talking about these blessings, you're thinking about Jesus and the Beatitudes. How many would say, that's exactly where my mind went. <laughs> when Jesus is preaching that amazing sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, remember he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so when you think about the blessed life, a life of rejoicing, God says, blessed is the man who, who keeps his testimonies and who seeks the Lord after the Lord with his whole heart. And I want you to think about that this morning with me, the rejoicing of the blessing, the rejoicing of the blessing. The word blessed does not mean burdened, bored, or bereaved. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> you say, preacher, why would you say that? Well, 
the kids sing in children's church this song about the poochy lip disease. How many of y'all ever heard them sing that song? And sometimes when you go to church, it looks like the poochy lip disease has spread throughout the congregation. <laughs> it doesn't mean bless the blessed man. It's not. It's not a boring life to live for God. It's not a burdensome life to live for God. It, it's not a life of of uh, nothingness and boy, I can't have joyful things and rejoicing in my life because after all, you have to live this Christian life and it's such a straight and narrow life. How in the world can Christians ever really be happy or rejoicing? And that's what the word blessed means. It means to be happy, but listen to me, not just happy, but it's in this sense. Oh, how happy! Right? It's not blessed. It's blessed! And there's a big difference, amen, between just being happy and being, oh, how happy. Happy is the man that keeps his testimonies and that seeks God with his whole heart. And I think Satan's done a, a brilliant job at convincing us that in Christianity there is not that rejoicing, joy, filled life. If you want pleasure and joy... You need to come to the world and you need to give in to the flesh and you need to do these things. We find out though when we go and do the things of the world that promise us joy, they're really not joyful things. How many of you have done something that you know that you should not do and when you were thinking about doing that, you thought, man, this is really what I need. If I could just do this, that's, that'll really satisfy something in my heart and then the moment that you did that, you were grieved in your spirit, you were embarrassed, and you had a sense of guilt that hung over your head and it was in your heart, right? Satan does a good job of trying to convince us that pleasure is found in sin, but he forgets to tell us the rest of the story. Sin, the pleasure of sin is for a season. And let me say something to you. That's a very short season. Amen? And don't forget this, that there's things about the sin that your flesh really uh, gets pleasure from. And there's no reason to deny that. We all know that's true. Remember in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, God told us about the man named Moses, and the Bible says about him in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And notice that's in plural, pleasures of sin for a season. Think about the choice that Moses made. Think about what Moses was willing to sacrifice and give up so that he could suffer with the people of God, so that he could be a faithful man of God. Most likely he was next in line to become Pharaoh over Egypt, the number one in command, the president, as it were. If, if not the number one leader in the land, certainly because of his relationship with the Pharaoh that was, Pharaoh's daughter was the one that raised Moses. He would have had access to all manner of riches and any pleasure that he desired. Can you imagine that? But Moses was willing to turn his back on the things of this world so that he might experience true joy and true blessing. And I know exactly what some of you think. You say, well... Watching him go through the wilderness don't look like he was very joyful at times, <laughs> preacher. He said that he was uh, laden down with a people that was a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. And you watch him. They're complaining all the time and they got problems all the time. Wouldn't he have been better off just to stay in Egypt and enjoy himself in Egypt? No, not at all. Because we forget something. You know what? In Egypt, there are stiff-necked, hard-hearted people. Amen? 
You get to the point the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Once you cross the fence and you look at it close enough, you see there's dead grass over here and dirt over here. It looks good at a distance, right? But when you get right down in it, you realize you're no better off here than you would be over there. How would you like to have been the Pharaoh in charge when God was executing judgment against that nation, Egypt, and they suffered the ten plagues? When you talk about having to deal with a stiff neck and rebellious people, there's always problems. You're going to face problems if you choose to live for God. And listen to me, if you say, well, I'm not going to live for God because I don't want to live this life, guess what? You're still going to face problems in the world. Amen? I'd rather be on God's side and face some difficulties and know that I'm pleasing Him than to be opposed to God and face difficulties and know at the end I'm going to suffer His wrath throughout eternity. Amen? There's always going to be troubles and trials that you have to face in life. Don't look at the difficulties that Moses had. Look at the blessed experience that this man had with the Creator of the world. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11, the Bible says this, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Moses had, Moses had such a blessed experience with God that when he came to God in prayer, it was as though Moses spoke to God face to face and Moses is known as the friend of God. That's what I'm talking about, the joy of being in the presence of the Creator of all things. Exodus 34, verse 16 said this, And the Lord passed before him. Remember Moses said, Lord, let me see your glory. I want, I, I've had a wonderful relationship with you, and I'm still not satisfied. I want to know more about you. <laughs> Lord, I've, I've talked with you face to face, but I want to see the full brightness of your glory. And God said, Moses, Moses said to, God said to Moses, Moses, nobody can look at my full, full glory and live. But I tell you what I will do. I love that part, don't you? He didn't say, well, Moses, tough luck. You're not going to get that. He said, I tell you what. I'll put you in a cleft of the rock. I'll hide my hand over you. And then when I pass by, you can see just the back side of my glory. And as he was passing by, the Lord spake, and the, as the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. As he passed by, he made that proclamation. Amen? Isn't that the God that you serve today? The God that's full of mercy, it's gracious, he's long-suffering, Abundant in goodness and in truth. Exodus 34, verse 29. When he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not, he did not know that his skin, the skin of his face, shone while he talked with him. He came down, he met Aaron, and he was unaware that when I have dwelt in the presence of God, God's glory has radiated on my life. And when he went down and talked with Aaron, that glory was just shining forth out of the man called Moses. And you know what? They couldn't look on him. There was a brightness about Moses because Moses had been with God that Moses actually had to put a veil on his face to be able to talk to Aaron and the rest of the people. Wow! <laughs> What a tremendous blessing. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart. Think about the blessing and joy of belonging to God. You see, either you belong to him or you belong to Satan. Amen? And there's not a third party. I'm starting to think we might need a third party in America. I mean, say amen to that. <laughs> it seems like there's only one party, and it's, a, and it's the party against the people, both of them. I'm starting to think we need a third party. But there's not 
a third party. Either you belong to Jehovah, to Jesus, or you belong to the devil. Remember the religious leaders came to Jesus and they were religious men, the Pharisees, and Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and of his desires or lust, you will do. You either belong to God or you belong to Satan. Amen? And it's joy. It's a joy just to know I belong to God. And not only do I belong to God, I have the joy of being with my God. Christianity is not like any other religion in the world. <laughs> it's not just lumped in with all the religions in the world. Christianity is unique <laughs> because we can come into the very presence of God Himself and we can enjoy time with the Creator. Moses was a great example of that, of a man who dwell in the presence of God and you have the opportunity and the privilege and the blessing of dwelling yourself in the presence of the great creator and what rejoicing that should bring to your heart but notice in Psalms 119 verse 2 the response of the blessed <laughs> in other words you don't just experience this blessing, these blessings that God is promising just because you're a child of God. He didn't say, happy is the man who simply believes the gospel. He said there's some conditions on this joy, this overflowing joy that you can experience as a Christian. I think sometimes we think, well, just because I'm a Christian, that means I automatically should be experiencing this overwhelming joy. But let me shock you this morning. There are few Christians that really are experiencing the joyfulness of Christianity. There are few that have genuine joy, even though it's a fruit of the Spirit. Even though they have the Holy Ghost within them, there are few Christians that really are joy-filled individuals. You say, why is that? It looks like every Christian should be filled with joy because there are two conditions mentioned here in Psalms 119, verse 2, that we're unwilling to pursue. Two conditions that we don't take seriously in our Christian life. Two things God instructs us to do but yet we won't devote ourselves to it, and because we won't devote ourselves to it, our Christianity is a lukewarm, lackluster type of Christianity. And by the way, when the world looks at that, it's not attractive at all. Amen? Why should they come to something that only increases their burden, <laughs> that only adds to their sorrow, that only gives them another list of things that they already have to do in this world that's already full of lists. That's not what Jesus offers. Jesus offers a loving, passionate relationship with Him. And if you would obey His Word and follow His in His footsteps, you'd find out that there is an overabundance of joy in this Christian life. And sadly, many Christians are missing out on that abundant joy. And I can't help but think of James chapter 4. Here James is writing to some Christians and he's trying to help these Christians. He said, you're warring and fighting and lusting and desiring. <laughs> that don't sound joyful to me. Does it sound joyful to you, James 4? You ask and you have not. And then... And, and, and what's, what's the problem? What's going on? Why are you in this case that you're in? And then he gives them these instructions. Resist the devil. Draw nigh to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. If you're going to have that vibrant relationship with Jesus, there has to be some, some yieldedness to His commandments and to His Word. And I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about... Jesus being the Lord of your life and you lovingly follow His directions that He gives to you. 
you know that experience in your own home. If you're a married couple, you know the difference between having a happy, joyful, loving relationship in the home. Amen? When the wife comes, there's, hey, how you doing? And when she leaves, you just drag the fingers because you can't stand to see her go. And there's happiness. And then you also probably, if you've been married long enough, amen, <laughs> don't even put your hand out to be held. Like, see you later, alligator. Right? Don't say amen to that because that might <laughs> tell us too much. We don't want to have to deal with that this morning. No marriage counseling <laughs> today. But you know what it's like. And, it, and it, it can be the same way in Christianity. And you say, what causes problems in marriages? Well, uh, selfishness causes problems in marriages. And you focus on what I want. And, what I, and what, well, how come they're not doing this? And I ask them to do that. And they don't want to do it. And all I ask is this. And they're unwilling to even do that. And, and disobedience and an unloving spirit. And it affects that home. Well, it, it affects your relationship with Jesus when He tells you something plainly to do out of a heart of love. He has never told you to do something because He's tried to hurt you or do you wrong or see, just laugh at you as you fall on your face. He's never told you. <laughs> Whatever He tells you, He tells you out of a deep love and care for you. But if you're unwilling to obey the voice of Jesus Christ, you can't expect to experience real, genuine joy. Amen? So he said in James 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And you know how many Christians are coming to the world and they're saying, hey, you know what, I'm just really bored. And I can't find joy. And something is missing in my life. And I was hoping, world, you might give me some joy. And you might give me some play. And let me tell you something. If you don't think that breaks the heart of Jesus, you are sadly mistaken. It's just like Hosea's wife as she went after those who paid her for her services and she thought that she was gaining from them and she was being blessed to them and she was getting from them what she wanted and she didn't even realize all the while it was the one who loved her that was feeding her and taking care of her and meeting her needs and, and would do anything for her. She didn't even know that. And yet she kept right on going after the men of the world who cared nothing for her as an individual. All they wanted for her is to please themselves. But here was a man who just wanted to please her and love her. And let me tell you something, it broke his heart. And it broke God's heart as he looked at Israel as they bowed before false gods and it breaks the heart of Jesus when we go to the world and say, world, help me. Give me something pleasurable and exciting. And Jesus said, listen, I promise you an overwhelming joy. And if you just do what I'd say, you'd experience that joy. And you know what real joy was. <laughs> if you would just obey me, blessed are they that keep or obey His testimonies. So I, I promise you something. Jesus, which has come to you from time to time, and He's given you some simple plain instructions. And you say, Preacher, I'm not really a happy Christian. You know why you're not a happy Christian? Because you're not even doing the simplest things that Jesus has told you to do. Yeah. We're not talking about the deep things, the weightier things. We're talking about elementary things that any Christian should do and ought to do just because they love Christ. And yet we find, what is, yet, what is it? Um, yet we find, we find even the simplest commandments. Really. You know, why me? Why, why can't somebody else do it? Eh. <coughs> like the guy that didn't want to go to church. You heard about him? 
Mother said, Wow, you need to go to church? You need to go to church? He said, Give me two reasons I should go. It's just the Lord's Day. You're supposed to be in His house on Sunday. And the second reason, you're the pastor. <laughs> and, and you know what? We think, Yeah, pastor should be in church. Guess what? If you're not here, we don't have nobody to pastor. <laughs> It's not just our responsibility to be faithful to the house of God. It's every Christian's responsibility to be faithful to the house of God. It's not the weightier issues that we're having problems with. It's some of the simplest things that the Lord has told us to do that we simply are not even doing them. For years, pastors have stood behind the pulpits all across America, yea, even in the world, and said, listen, if you don't read your Bible and spend time with Jesus, it's going to affect your life. You can't ignore Jesus and think you're going to grow as a Christian. And let me tell you something. Still 95% of Christians are not reading their Bible and praying every day. They act as though it's not important. And yet Jesus did that. He read his Bible, prayed every day, and he wouldn't miss any worship services because he wanted to be a good example to us. See, we're not even doing the simplest things. Remember Jesus said... The wise man is who? He's the one that is building his house on a rock. And, and when the storms come and troubles come, he's going to be able to stand. Why is he going to be able to stand? Because he built his life on the Word of God. But guess what? For every one of us, the storms are coming, the rain's coming, the flood's coming. And if you built your life on disobedience or you built your life on what the world has said when they come your life is going to come crashing down and Jesus said great was the fall of it if you'll learn to obey Jesus you'll find renewed joy it's always amazing to me when the kids go to camp and they go to camp and they spend seven days and they get a devotion in the morning and it's preaching before lunch and then they get Time, activity time after lunch and preaching at night. And then about Wednesday night, boy, their hearts are starting to warm up and glow. And Friday night, they're coming back. And they're, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do great things for God. and I'm going to live for God. And then two weeks later, they're back in the same cold condition. And they wonder, why is my heart so cold again? Because... When you're at the camp meeting, you got exposed to the Word of God, Word of God, Word of God. Next day, Word of God, the Word of God. The word, next day, the Word of God. And you got fed and fed and fed. And it was force feeding, yes, but you still were fed. <coughs> and, you, and you felt strengthened by it and determined, I'm going to be a great Christian. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do something wonderful for Jesus. And then you got home, you starved yourself again. You got weak. And you lost your desires to live for God. It's where you left it. Amen? Not just obedience, because I know this is true. Some of you are obeying the Lord. You're doing the things that Jesus has taught you to do. That Psalms is true. You're keeping His testimony. You know what's right, and you're doing right, and you're still saying, Preacher, I, I'm not joyful. Well, He said, Listen, it's also a matter of whether or not you're going to seek after me with your entire heart. And you know the truth is, and if we just be honest with ourselves, a lot of us are distracted. <laughs> we, we've got our eyes off of Jesus. And we're looking at something or someone that really can't meet our needs. We're, we're, we're going, we're still doing right, but our heart is not fixed on Jesus Christ. We're not passionate. We, we don't, it's not a must for us. I must have Jesus. That's not the thrust of our life. And Jesus said, listen, you can be like a Pharisee if you want to and, and cross all the T's and dot, it has to be stopped, slow down when I say that because I get that twisted up, and dot all the I's and still be miserable. Why? Because if your heart's not in it, you're never going to experience true joy. And there must be that passionate pursuit of Jesus if you're going to experience a real intimate relationship with Him. And let's, let me say something. There's nothing like leaving the prayer closet and knowing I have just spent time with the God of heaven. And sometimes God's been gracious to us and we've 
been in church services and we thought, wow, God really met with us today. I remember attending a uh, associational meeting. I think it was a state meeting. And it was back when they had our state meetings in local churches and they were having our state meeting this time in, in Chifley, Florida with the Chifley pre Old Baptist Church. <laughs> and we had gathered to worship and do business and I'm telling you, heaven came down. The old saints testified. Tears were rolling down their face. There was a sense of celebration and joy and it was an amazing atmosphere in the state meeting. That's the last place in the world you experience. They expect to experience that kind of awesome presence of God. That's joyful, amen? Yeah. When's the last time you left your time of prayer, you got up off of your knees with fresh, hot tears rolling down your face, knowing I've just spent some wonderful time with Jesus? You say, I can't remember that. And that's why your joy is not flowing over today. It's a shameful thing that the Pentecostals attract so many of the Baptists and Presbyterians and all of that because when you go to their church, it might it might be a almost a forced matter, but I'm telling you, there's amens and raising his hands and clapping his hands and it's enthusiastic and it's exciting and the truth be known, we realize there should be much more of that in our church than what there is. Amen? And that's why it's appealing to some people. Right, Brother Sparks? Seek Jesus with all your heart. In the book of James, he mentions twice in the book of James, you double-minded. James, by using that statement, you double-minded, he's saying something else has got a part of your heart. Something else has your attention, your attractions are divided. You love Jesus, but the truth is there's, it's something, money, material things, something there that's getting your heart's attention to. And until you realize that and repent of it and give it all to Jesus, you're going to keep dragging through the Christian life thinking, where is the joy Jesus promised me? A joyful home is a united home. A joyful Christian life is a united Christian life. One who, who is united to Christ Jesus completely. The reality of that blessedness. There's some things <laughs> that this world will never, uh, needs this world will never meet in your life. There's some things in your life the world can do absolutely nothing about. It can't touch you. It can't help you. And no matter what you do in the world, it never satisfies. Because the world didn't create you. You're created by the eternal God. You were formed in your mother's womb by Him. And there is a God-shaped void in every single person that walks on planet Earth. And the world can't fill that void. Only Jesus can. The Bible puts it like this. There's a thirst that only God can quench. Amen? Um, how many of you like uh, sodas or pops? Depends on what part of the country you're from. Coke, Cokes? Hang on. Oh, come on. Be honest. I mean, you know, cold. All right, thank you. Bunch of health nuts. <laughs> and, and, I, and I see, right? And if you're playing football and you're, you know, really putting out your energy, what's something you might want if you're out there doing that? Gatorade, Gatorade right? Sometimes we're working around here even, and the boys will say, Dad, I'm going to the store, you want, you want a Gatorade? And I say, absolutely, you know. But when you're thirsty, really thirsty, there's only one thing that quenches that thirst, and it's water. And everything else has stuff added to it that the flesh likes. But really the only thing that quenches that thirst is water. And let me tell you something. You might enjoy the sodas and the pops 
of the world and you might like your sweet peas and you might like your Gatorades, but let me tell you something, when it comes to Christianity, there's only one, one, one only who is satisfying, and that is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the water of life. And if you'll come to him, he will satisfy your thirsty soul. And he put the Bible puts it another way. He said, I'm the bread of life. And Jesus said, I'm the only one that can meet that hunger in your heart. You know what hunger I'm talking about? Hunger that food has nothing to do with. It doesn't touch that hunger in your heart that can't be satisfied by anything in the world, but a hunger that's fully satisfied when you come to Jesus. It is fully satisfied when you come to Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. If you'll come to Jesus this morning, Jesus can meet your needs. He can. He promises that He will. If you're in this service and you're lost, you say, Preacher, what does it mean to be lost? It means you've never repented of your sins and then put your faith in Jesus. That don't mean that you're sinless, but it means this, I don't want my sin anymore. And let me tell you something, there are a lot of people that are lost simply, they have faith, they believe it all, but they really don't want to let go of sin. How many would say that's right? I mean, I know people. They believe it. They don't. They don't deny anything you said, preacher. They agree with everything you said. The devils do, right? Well, why aren't the devils saved then? Because they refuse to repent of their rebellion. They're apostates. They can never do that. But the point is this: they willfully want that that God said no. And you can't ever be saved until you say, Jesus, I'm through with sin. I don't want sin. I want you. And if the Holy Ghost of God is dealing with your heart about that matter of letting go of sin and, and coming to Jesus, listen to me, that's the day of salvation. Hallelujah. When you rather have Jesus than anything this flesh has ever offered you. Amen? Christ can meet your needs in salvation. And listen, Christian, if you're hurting, Jesus can help. There is, there is a bomb in Gilead. If you can learn to come to Christ, you can be like the Apostle Paul, my last point, even in chains, in stocks, in the prison, you can be singing hallelujahs to Jesus. Amen? With a bloody, beaten back, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm heaven bound. And I thank you, God, that I'm, I have the privilege of suffering for Christ. This is a wonderful blessing. And you can have joy even in the middle of trials and tribulations and heartbreaks and sorrows. Amen? Come to Jesus. Obey His Word. And seek Him with great passion. And I promise you, God doesn't lie on the blessed is the man. Amen? The man or woman that wants the blessing of God, obey His Word and seek His face. And God said, you'll have joy this world cannot give you. Hallelujah. If you're lost, come to Jesus. If you need help, you come. Jesus will help you this morning. Amen? Let's stand for a word of prayer.